So uh, my name's Serena and I work at Common Street Arts and Waterville Creates. Common Street Arts is uh, in fact um, a program of Waterville Creates and um, we've been doing weekly videos. Um, we have been doing just Thursdays and now we're doing Tuesdays and Thursdays. And the idea behind the Tuesday is that hopefully it's a little bit higher um, teaching level so adults could join in though adults are welcome on Thursdays as well. Thursdays just happens to be our day that we were always doing our after school. So today we're going to do kitchen still life and um, still life is one of those things that um, has a really long history in art and sometimes people look at still life and are like oh well that's kind of like boring it's objects but here's one of the cool things about Still life. So still life actually tells us a little bit about everyday life. And right now we're all in our houses and there's lots of objects around us and why not practice drawing them? Last week we looked at drawing um, Rory the cat and our pets. And you know, one of the things about pets is that they move all the time, but with objects, they're not gonna move around. Much easier for us to look at and to draw. We probably don't need to make quick gesture drawings of a still life. We still wanna use our shapes. But with a still life, what's great is that we, um, we have things that aren't gonna move. Now, um, still life has a pretty long history, like I said, so let me show you just a couple things you could look up if you'd like to. So I asked my friend Veronique Plesch if she would tell me a little bit of art history of still life. So she works at Colby, she's an art history professor. And here's a few names that she gave me. So thanks to Veronique. So um, these are some folks that you could look up. These, um, none of these are super modern. I am gonna show you someone a little more modern in a minute. So you can look these up. You can look at some of the still life painting. And like I said, still life shows you everyday life, but in some cases, really people were interested in very fancy, fancy objects. So showing off some object that they loved or showing off some really, really rich food that they like to eat. There's a lot of still life of cheese, which I appreciate, right? We all appreciate cheese probably. Um, but I wanna show you also, when still life is done um, by a student, we're gonna show you a work by a student. So it is the last day of our Youth Art Month um, exhibition, which right now is closed, but I thought I'd show you one uh, still life and it is a donut still life and what's really fun about this and Ian you might have to also kind of help figure out where to put that in the frame <laughs> so there's your donut still life an ode to a donut um the thing that's great about this still life is it's a lot about color and form and uh, this is by the way by Eli Meter it's titled Donut, it's a great title, and it's an oil pastel with colored pencil and tempera paint, and I think actually that is a real doily that is in, the, um, is in this work. This is from Madison Elementary School, and the art educator in this case is Lisa Ingram, or Ingraham, sorry. Um, so that's a fourth grade's work, a fourth grader's work, and that's a more modern example of a still life, right? A still life that's looking really at form, and color and we're going to really look at light and dark and shading before um before we totally start on what we're going to do i do want to mention a couple vocabulary words so this is a vocabulary word that um of course the dog is also deciding this is the time for him to do a few like digging things anyway this is um, a vocabulary word for, for art. It's an ellipse. So an ellipse is a geometric shape that results from viewing a circular shape in perspective. So um, this is the art definition of ellipse. There are scientific de definitions of ellip ellipse and math definitions. Um, this really is about perspective and how we see a circle. And we'll actually do a little practice of that today. So um, those are for you to look up online. I'm actually going to save this for a second. And um, I do want to talk about, um, we are choosing simple objects. However, if you wanted to choose an object in your house to practice with that you really loved, that would be great. One of the things about objects that is kind of interesting as human beings is that we tend to attach a meaning to an object. So I have an example of that. 
So um, this is an object I happen to really love, objects. It's a salt and pepper shaker that are frogs. And I love these because one, I love frogs, and two, my mom gave them to me for Christmas. And I totally think they're kind of hilarious and funny. And so I love having them in my kitchen because I get to see them and they make me smile. So that's an object I love. And then Ian picked an object that he likes. <clears throat> so want me to hold it up, Ian? <laughs> so why do you love this object? I love this object because it's handmade and I find it to be beautiful. It's, it's one of a kind. And I love it. <laughs> yes. Also, there was um, a Star Wars action figure was used in the design of this object. Yeah. And I also love it because you gave it to me mm -hmm. and I love you. Oh, thanks, honey. <laughs> that makes me cry. Okay. <laughs> what a jerk. What a jerk. What a nerd. Okay. So um, this also made homemade, which is so cool. This is Brian Saldano who made this and he made it especially for Ian. And I do love that it has Boba Fett, which is Ian's favorite Star Wars character. So you can pick an object that you love to draw, or you can pick something a little more simple to start with. You'll notice that Ian and I have set up a light. Can you see it in the frame? So this light is a Crayola crayon light, but what's good is there's no shade on it. And so we get some really good um, light coming in for our um, still life. Um, and then uh, let's talk a little bit about composition. So I kind of set this up this way because you can see it and I can see it and it'll work pretty well. But you can play around with composition a little bit. So um, we can switch these around. We can have all three in a row. But notice how that, I don't know, maybe it's an okay composition, but I think it's a little bit boring. I like the overlap of objects that I can see like this. That's kind of nice for me. I love this handle of this this jug. I actually chose this because it reminded me of like what you might traditionally see in a still life. It's great shape and form. So I'm just going to arrange my still life in a way that's pleasing to me. I'm going to overlap my subjects a little bit and then I'm also going to adjust my light. If you don't have a light at home, it's fine. Um, it works really well to have daylight too. So in here in this kitchen, I'm getting a lot of like bounced light from over there and reflected light off the table, but this light is giving me some nice shadow and light, which is kind of fun. So um, you can set up your still life um, a little bit and set up your composition. And while you do that, I'm just gonna mention one thing. So you can set up your still life and I'm going to also tell you about a poet. Um, which I realize makes me makes me kind of kind of nerdy, but I love poetry, <laughs> and so I wanted to just tell you about one poet, um, one of my favorites, and that is Pablo Neruda. So he did a lot of poems that were odes to things. So I was thinking about when I was setting this up. I was thinking about how really still life is like an ode to things. It's really what is an ode? What's I have the definition. An ode is a lyric poem um, addressing a particular subject and it's often noble and lofty. In other words, it's exalting and celebrating something. So um, in this case, what Pablo Neruda does is he takes, he makes odes to common things. He has a book that's called Odes to Common Things by Pablo Neruda. And on the cover of that great book is this really wonderful still life of a salt shaker. So he takes this poetic form, which is to like talk about how great something is. And what he does is he actually talks about things like his socks and tomatoes and onions. And um, they're really super fun and I think kind of great accessible poems. So while you're setting up your still life, getting your composition ready, I was just gonna read you just a few lines from Pablo Neruda's poem, which is, called Odes to Common Things. And he says, I have a crazy, crazy love of things. I like pliers and scissors. I love cups, rings, and bowls, not to speak, of course, of hats. I love all things, not just the grandest, but also the infinitely small. 
oh yes, the planet here is sublime with things. So um, one of the reasons I also wrote this down is because I know Ian loves things and I thought he would appreciate that poem. <laughs> um, some of us love things more than, you know, other people. A lot of people love to collect things, so if you have a collection of things, you could certainly do some drawings of those things too. All right, so I'm gonna take a drink and let's get down to work on our still life. So hopefully you have a composition you like. If you don't, you're also welcome to use my composition here. Though I think at home it's gonna be harder for you to see um, shadow and light of this composition. So um, one thing about still life to also mention are those ellipses. So I have an example of an ellipse just to show you um, perspective. So you'll notice when you look at a circle straight on, it's a circle. But as soon as I tilt this, you can actually see the shape of the circle becomes more flattened. I don't know if that, can you tell that kind of from there? Yeah, you're getting flattened ellipses. One thing you could do at home if you wanted to is actually just experiment by holding your arm out with your soup can or anything else that has a rounded, like a rounded top. Your, you could do a mug, you could do a soup can, anything really, and just hold it out and then try seeing what happens to that circle as you move it around. Um, so you can try that with a soup can or anything, but you are going to notice, right, the, cha the change in the circle as you change your perspective to the thing, if that makes sense. Um, Often when doing still life, by the way, it's really nice to have a little bit of space between you and your subject so that your, where you're sitting and where you're, or where you're standing, um, you have a certain eye line so that you're, like if I move this, if I move forward to my subject, all of a sudden I'm seeing more of a widened circle. If I sit here, I have a flattened circle. So sometimes it's nice to have a certain space that you sit for your still life and you stay in that space. So I'm, ha I'm a little close to my subject, but that's because we're working. Um... Could, could we see Mr. Broccoli? Oh, Mr. Broccoli. <laughs> did you ask that or did someone else? <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah, this is Mr. Broccoli. And this is um, a soup can. And I, I covered up the label just in case, like, you know, we, we didn't want to do ads for a certain soup companies, I think. I don't know. That's what I decided. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right, so, um, okay, so, um, I am just pulling apart, this is my kneadable putty eraser, but I also have just a regular eraser too. Um, so once you have your, your setup, the first thing you kind of look at, again, is what shapes do you have? Um, I would start with shapes, and I would also start with um, where they all relate, how they all relate to each other, like the negative space around them, meaning like I see space around all of these things, right? And even just knowing the negative space helps us a little bit also. So I'm going to start with, um, you can even start this if you wanted. Some people start with just drawing a line in the space and then setting up where they think each of the objects is going to fall um, in that line. So if I was saying my jar top is here, my banana top is here from my perspective, and then the, the apples down here, I can even measure them if I want to get really exact. You can even measure them, and a lot of people use their pencil to do so. Now, I am too close to my subject to really measure correctly, but I can show you a little bit how to do that. I personally love to just start making art and sketching, but some people love to get it more exact. That's not really my style, but I want to show you how to do that in case you want to. We have a comment that says, Serena the Great. And we also have a comment that says, love Mr. Broccoli. <laughs> oh, nice. Thank you. Who is, that's nice. It's really great. Jeez. Um, uh, by the way, I know, I think Penny and Lucy are watching today. Um, Lucy, I saw your mom yesterday. She said you might be watching, which is cool. Um, 
So let me show you uh, a little bit about measuring something. So if you, you are a person that likes to get things really exact, that's not really my style, but it is some people's style and it's great to try. Um, one thing you can use is your pencil as a measuring tool. Now, again, I'm really close to my subject. Um, but your pencil at arm's length can act like a measuring tool. I'm actually going to take the eraser off so you can sort of see that. So if I'm, say I'm looking at something um, across from me, I can actually measure it using my pencil and, and really get it very exact on my paper. So here's an example. Pretend my arm is, I guess it's all the way outstretched. <laughs> um, what I notice is that using my pencil as a measure, that the vase or the jug, I guess it's a jug, really takes up the whole pencil length. So on my paper, I could actually make, make the jug like the length of the pencil. Now, that's pretty simple, but where does the banana fall compared to the jug? I can actually just move my thumb up and say, oh, okay, you know what it is? It's got about this much from the top and I can measure it on my paper and put the line. And actually I got kind of close. I can put the line of where, so here's my jug again, kind of close to my subject for this kind of thing. And then I can measure, and then I can even measure where is the banana in comparison to, where's the apple in comparison to the banana. And then I can measure that, which actually, looks like when I started it, I got it, it's a little bit off. So this is a great measuring tool. It's, it works best when you're a little bit farther from your subject. So you can say, you know, like I have Ian sitting right here. I can say, okay, his head, <laughs> he's sitting up nice and straight. His head takes up that length and then his torso goes to here. So I would know on my paper what how to actually divide it up. You can get really exact. You can actually do like, okay, that's a third maybe, and another third, and another third. So you can translate that to your paper. So um, that's one way to, to kind of get your still life going. So I'm gonna start, and I'm gonna sit back a little bit for my subjects. And I'm gonna start again with shapes. You'll notice that an apple is a round shape, but it's not per not completely a circle, right? But I can put a circle on my paper. And the banana's like an oval. And then I'm gonna also put in the jug. I've already put in lines for myself to kind of figure out where they each are in comparison to each other. Um, and actually, I began this drawing a little bit and I can show you. What's funny is when I'm looking at this is that on my paper, it looks like I should be able to see the bottom part of the apple, but I can't really. So just think about this. Always keep looking at your subject because if I was just looking at the paper, I would draw the bottom of the apple thinking I could really see it, but I really can't from my perspective. You guys can see it, I'm sure. So just train yourself, if you can, to just keep looking, looking, looking. Like that's really the work of observational drawing and still life in general is like, what does it really look like? What do I really see um, versus what I think I, I'm gonna see? So train yourself as much as possible to keep looking up at your subjects. Another trick to still life, once I've gotten all my shapes, is to now look at light and dark. One of the things that helps, and I learned this trick from my mom, is squinting, which sounds funny. But um, if I look at this right now, I can see light and dark. But if I squint, I can actually say, where do I see really bright parts? And where do I see really dark parts? So what I'm noticing if I squint is that I'm seeing very dark parts and shadow at the base of the, of the jar, inside the jar here. I'm also seeing a pretty dark part here on the apple 
And then I'm also seeing these awesome shadows, which I think you guys can probably sort of see. Um, yeah, I can't quite fit it all. One thing is I chose kind of a small piece of paper. I'm gonna show you, can, can they kind of see this so far? Yeah. Um, so this is starting with shape and some shading. And really just keep working on the shapes and keep looking for shadow. I like to start with dark and then go to light. I don't totally know why that is, but I, that's what I like. Maybe it was how I was taught. Um, one thing uh, is also dark, kind of a, once you get like the dark pieces in, you can really... Um, Jess says we love Serena Sam. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. You're the best. Jess, you're the best. Um, so um, another thing about light and shadow, you can actually learn a lot about light and shadow, especially like if we had let uh, curtains on our windows, we could actually really look at this. You could look at how there's bright light reflections, which I think you guys can probably see some reflections on the apple, especially because it's a little bit glossy. Um, you can also see the darkest parts, but here's the other piece is that you also get light reflects off of surfaces. So we have a tabletop here that it's reflecting off. If we had a black tabletop, we'd get less reflection, but we have this marble one. And so we're seeing actually light in places that, like I wouldn't expect, right? I'm seeing some light on this side away from the light, but what's happening is that light is c coming down onto the table, hitting it and reflecting back onto the jar. So when you're looking at this, sometimes you look at it and go, well, why is there light in this funny place that I don't expect? And that's why, because light will hit surfaces and reflect back. Um, now, again, I have a little complex light too because I'm getting window light and natural light too, which is kind of nice, actually, kind of pretty. Um, I'm gonna actually show you the other thing you can notice is on your paper, you can mark out like the brighter spots, I often tend to mark out the brighter spots for myself and the shapes that they make, um, which are abstract shapes. They're not really, they're not really, um, uh, what's the word I want? So the, they're like, they're an abstract shape of, of light and you could draw those shapes. I'm gonna actually show you what I mean you can draw those shapes where the light is to help you kind of remember where you're going to either erase some of the things that you were doing. Um, for example, I've put like this circle here to give myself a jar shape, but it's actually interrupting a very light space on, the shape, on this jar. So what I'll probably go back and do is I will erase the lines of that circle that I used as a reference so that I can get a nice light shape where I'm seeing all that light. Um, okay, so I'm gonna work on a little bit figuring out where are my light spaces and where are my dark spaces. One thing you're gonna notice also about when you're doing the shading, is the closer you can put your pencil lines to each other, kind of like the more realistic it's gonna look. Like um, if I'm doing if I'm doing shading that has lines that are really separate from each other, it looks a little less real than if I'm like really going close with my pencil, and that takes a little while. So you're welcome to take a long time to really like go in and and go to work that way so now if I get to a point where I see I've got a lot of light I can again go back with my pencil and pull off my eraser sorry and pull off some of the some of the pencil around it
Um, I am again struggling with the um, talking and drawing thing. I find it, I find that really hard to do, and I wonder if it has to do with something about how my brain works, but I have a hard time talking and drawing. And with my pencil, I think ideally I would actually really pretty much do pencil marks on the entire thing um, if I'm really looking at light and dark carefully. I may not do that now because um, we want to keep our video under like an hour and a half. <laughs> So I, I just keep filling in, right? I keep filling in and filling in, and eventually I will have this whole thing done. But you can see there was this really bright light here, bright here, bright here, and then I have reflected light here on this side. Now for you, it's gonna look a little different depending on your perspective of where you're seeing it from. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit of the apple. So again, I originally started with a circle and then I realized really an apple is got kind of a flattened top and it also has this really wonderful dip here where there's a lot of nice dark shadow. Um, another thing about um, still life. I'll, and I'll show you actually what I'm up to on the apple. Do you see that okay? So I'm seeing a lot of dark here and I'm seeing dark here, but I'm also seeing mid-tones and tons of reflected light, but also this shadow that I think is really from the jug. Um, so again, still life is all about looking and noticing. And if you want to make it really detailed, you can, but you can also choose the route of coloring, which is also really fun. I'm giving us apple some reflections. Um, okay, let me show you. So I'm just working on what I see for light and dark on this on this apple. Um, I have been really tempted to put in the lines of the apple a little bit of the color, but I'm just sticking right now with just light and dark. Now, for some reason, I'm also noticing, um, I feel like the banana is a little bit of a challenge for me, and I'm not sure. I think it might just have to be the to the shape, and I'm being distracted by its yellow, yellow color. But I'm gonna show you how I might start with this. Mm, it's not quite done, but that's okay. All right, so you're getting an idea, right? I could actually spend a super long time filling this in and then the other thing I might want to do is actually fill this piece in um, one thing you can do with bigger spaces like that is set, instead of using your pencil this way you use it kind of like like the side of the pencil it gives you a lot more to work with um, and then you can fill it in faster See how that fills in faster if you use the side of your pencil. And actually some artists love to use the side of their pencil. Um, I just have a fondness for the, um, I, have a, I have a fondness for the like sharp, sharp edges of the pencil, like I like working that way. But um, if I'm gonna fill in a whole bunch, I can use my pencil this way. And it's actually a thing that you can experiment with. Like, do you like to use the side of your pencil? That way you can get big movements I'm using a small piece of paper, but if I was making a still life, I might also decide to use a bigger piece of paper so that I can fill it, but also so that I don't run out of space. 
like this could start to look kind of cramped because I don't have a ton of space on my paper, right? I'm actually going to run out of space where the shadow from the banana lands, which is okay right now. Okay, so um, let's see, what else do I wanna talk about here? So I think those are all the parts I just kind of wanted to cover. I wanted to cover um, the ellipse. So uh, for me, the ellipse that I'm seeing that really is a circle from the top, but from the side, that is this ellipse, right? Which is the top of the jug. And I have an ellipse for the apple, which really isn't totally round anyway, but appears more squished depending on where I sit. I also wanted you to look at light and dark. So looking at where's the brightest parts that I see, where's the darkest parts that I see. So for you guys, that's gonna be some different spaces than me, but you're definitely probably seeing dark here. And I'm seeing reflected light. So when you look at any object and light, you can think to yourself, where's the darkest and lightest parts? Where is their reflected light? And where is, um, and where, where is the midtone? Like what is the, what part is a midtone? So the midtones can, can really help you. Like on this apple, it really helps to put in midtones and gives it a little bit more shape. You can play around with your pencil too to figure out um, how that might best work. So, okay, I think, we're, I think we're done with the lesson part. I want you guys at home to keep working. You can keep getting as detailed as you want or as not detailed, it's just up to you. I might actually work on this a little bit more too um, and then I can post a picture of it so I can get a little bit more details. What's great about still life is, again, you're looking at objects that are stationary. It also tells a story sometimes. In this case, um, I'm really choosing simple objects, but you could also start to look at more complex objects or objects that you love. So, um, you know, sometime I might actually try drawing my awesome frog salt and pepper shakers, but if you look at these guys, you'll notice there's a lot of reflected light there. There's like a ton of spaces and shapes for me to look at. So this might be a more complex drawing. It might take me a little bit longer, but I can work up, I can work from simple to more complex. And really this frog is just made up of a lot of, of, shapes and planes of light and really I could just keep looking at all of the parts of it and and eventually get a really cool drawing so did you have a thing no oh sorry <laughs> um okay so I think that's all we wanted to talk about for still life I would love 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 to see your results so please um either either you can post them in the comments for the video you can send us them also on our Facebook Messenger and we can post them if you don't mind. Um, also, I will work on mine a little bit more and then post it at some point. Um, and then Thursday we'll be doing um, another three o'clock uh, and the, let's see, Thursday we're doing outside plan air. So we'll be doing, actually we're gonna do the front yard I think. So we'll be in the front yard and I'm gonna specifically look at how landscape works and um, trees, how to draw trees. So um, we're in the neighborhood in Hollowell, so there are other people's houses, but I'm going to really just look at landscape. So we'll be looking at landscape. If you want to, you can um, be in your backyard or outside if it's safe for you to do so. For us, we're pretty far away from a neighbor, so it's okay for us to do that. If it isn't, you're also welcome just to follow along with what we'll be drawing outside. So we don't have a grand, huge landscape, but we at least we have some bushes and trees, and I would love to show you how to draw, um, especially uh, pine, like coniferous trees. So um, we'll, we'll look at that. And then I have um, the next few weeks we'll have set up pretty soon. So um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, you can count on us being here on at three o'clock. And then Fridays at one o'clock, we also will have a guest artist. And this Friday is one of my favorite artists. Um, it is Russ Cox and he is really amazing. He's an illustrator of children's books. And we're gonna basically stream one of his live videos that you can draw along with. And what's great about Russ's setup is he has a setup from above, which actually I, by the way, Ian and I are working on how we would do that here. We just don't have a great tripod to do that with. 
So um, at some point we may actually get a little more sophisticated and, and come from above so you can see it better. But he will be doing, I believe, um, he's doing a character because that's one of his one of his favorites. I think he's doing a character playing a musical instrument. I believe he's being inspired by all the great musicians that are going online. So, um, so Thursday, you're welcome to join us and Friday, you're welcome to join us and please share your work. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>